I apologize ahead because I've been like sick this past week, so I didn't get quite completely polished. And now it's snowing outside, so I'm distracted. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. Okay, so this week's Torah portion is entitled Kayai Sarah, which means Life of Sarah. I decided not to look into the Hafa Torah portion this week because Daniel already did a sermon on 1 Kings 1 not too long ago. If you haven't watched it yet, I highly recommend checking it out at the Corner Fringe YouTube channel. It's called Pride and is located in the One Part Teaching playlist. I also recommend regularly reviewing and sharing other videos there as well. Instead, my commentary today will stem from Genesis 24, and we'll look at Isaac and Rebecca versus today's dating culture. I want to use the story of Isaac and Rebecca as a starting point to see how the Bible warns of dangers in ways couples are usually formed in our society today. When I think of detailed biblical accounts of boy meets girl, the two that come to my mind are Isaac and Rebecca here and King David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Isaac and Rebecca were brought together by God, while David and Bathsheba were brought together by David's sinful desires. Today we see most of the world's relationships also brought about by the latter. I intend to look at what the Bible has to say on this topic as I continue. Genesis 24, Abraham asks his servant to find a wife for his son, Isaac, after Sarah died. Go in verse 3. And I will make you swear by Yahweh, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. I've heard people accuse God and the Bible of being racist because of such instructions. This isn't about race, but rather the behavior of the people and the influence they can have. Here's a warning Nehemiah gave when he found fellow Jews who had married pagan women. Nehemiah 13.26 Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. When two people marry, they become one in the eyes of God, as shown in Genesis 2.24. With a bond this close, the individuals will no doubt affect each other. As Nehemiah pointed out, even the wise King Solomon was led astray by his pagan wives. When looking for a spouse, you should look for someone who will encourage your faith and bring you closer to God, not someone who will lead you away from him. When continuing in Genesis 24, Verse 5, the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham replies in verse 8, And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. Here we see the bride-to-be has to be willing. If you believe God has a spouse for you, but that person doesn't have the same conviction, let them be. If it's truly from God, it will eventually happen. In the meantime, though, don't give yourself emotionally to that person. Daniel referenced 2 Samuel 13 in the Death of America teaching about struggling with homosexuality. In that chapter, Amnon was in love with his sister Tamar so much that it made him physically sick. Instead of detaching his emotions from her, he gave in to them, and it ultimately led to his death. We shouldn't be seeking our fulfillment in another person. We should be seeking it in Yeshua. Now going to verse 12, after the servant had left Abraham, he said, O Yahweh, God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Here we see the servant doing the most important thing when looking for Isaac's spouse, consulting God and asking for his direction. He goes on to ask God for a sign that the servant would ask a woman for water and the woman would reply by also watering his ten camels. I'm not recommending anyone look for a spouse by going to a gas station, asking people for coffee, and waiting for someone to also fill your gas tank. But I do believe there's a lot of great insight in this chapter. Going to verse 16, Now the young woman, Rebecca, was very beautiful to behold, a virgin. No man had known her, and she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. 
And the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. Now notice how the servant put in the effort to go seek out Rebecca. The Bible mentions her beauty, and I'm guessing that's what attracted the servant to her. Now no doubt, physical appearance does play a large part in who people decide to court. And physical attraction is important in a marriage relationship. Unfortunately, the physical attraction is what gets emphasized, at least here in the U.S., where we are bombarded with a dating culture. Instead of letting God lead us and trusting him in finding a spouse, there's an overriding mentality that we need to go buffet style and check out a bunch of people until we find someone compatible. This causes people to physically and emotionally commit to others until they find a problem. Then the relationship gets cut and there's hurt left over. Paul contrasts the married and single life throughout 1 Corinthians 7. He explains how not being married can be a blessing. Verse 32, But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. Paul demonstrates that being single has advantages. But is he saying it's wrong to get married? If we go on to verse 36, we read, But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. As with many things in scripture, there is a balance. Like with the whole idea of grace and works supposedly being at odds with each other, one of Satan's tactics is to lead us all the way in one direction so we miss out on the overall truth. This also considers what Proverbs says. 18.22, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from Yahweh. So we see there are great blessings from being single and also from being married. However, the world unhealthily pushes on us that we need to have a partner and we need to have physical interaction. Everywhere you look, sex is promoted, and the more our flesh is fed with temptation, the more it lusts. That's why Paul warns us, 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful lusts. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee sexual immorality. Now the law goes into plenty of detail about what constitutes sexual immorality, but in the context of Genesis 24 and a man and a woman, we need not go further than the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Now the Hebrew word for adultery is na'af. Strong's indicates this involves a man with another man's wife. Likewise, society in large part says it's okay for people to get intimate as long as they're not married to other people. But Yeshua gives us an even deeper understanding of the spirit of the seventh commandment. Matthew 5:27. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This harkens, back to, this harkens back to the verses from Paul's letters we looked at just earlier. We must be careful what we look at and what we think about. On a side note, a while back I was debating someone on Facebook about whether or not we still need to follow the law. He said that Jesus gave us a new law in his sermon on the mount in Matthew 5. The idea that when he said, you have heard it said, but I say, was that Yeshua was dismissing the law and replacing it. But that would contradict what Jesus said just prior. Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The person I was debating was saying that the law in verse 17 was different from the commandments in verse 19. But you have to create an imaginary line in there and ignore the testimony of the Old Testament to come to that conclusion. Incidentally, while we're here, notice verse 19 warns against teaching others to sin. Going back to how Yeshua warns not to lust, I believe it also follows that you are, if you are enticing someone to lust, that is also sin. Imagine that's why Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 2.9, In like manner also, 
that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. But remember, this doesn't give you a license to lust if you do see someone scantily dressed. So what is the real intent of Yeshua saying, you heard this, but I say? Well, one example would be a mom telling her son to look both ways before crossing the street. He then looks both ways, sees a car coming, and proceeds to start walking onto the street. His mother quickly pulls him back out of harm's way. I said, look both ways, but if a car is coming, you have to wait. Yeshua wasn't disqualifying the law, but rather clarifying it. I hope this makes sense. But as I close, to sum up Genesis 24, Rebecca passed the servant's test, and he went with her to meet her family. It's important getting married that you get the blessings of the families in, in, uh, who are involved, too. Uh, she agreed to go back to meet Isaac, and the chapter concludes with verse 67. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Now, I hope that today I was able to demonstrate how important sexual purity is in the eyes of God. Also, I hope I didn't give the impression that I never struggled in these areas. It is a difficult topic to discuss and to walk out. We need to turn to fellow believers that we trust and are strong in the faith for encouragement. And we need to deny our flesh by praying, fasting, and studying the word. A lot of what Daniel covered in the Death of America Homosexuality Sermon can also apply to heterosexuals struggling with lust. I'd like to close with some verses of hope to show that Despite stumbling in the past, we can turn around our lives and live in purity henceforth. Psalm 103.12, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Acts 3.19, repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Shabbat shalom.